preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Thank you very much, John. Let me also add a word of welcome to all of you. Uh, I hope some of you are repeaters from the previous series, which uh, uh, I certainly enjoyed, and I, I hope the audience and the guests did. Uh, I'm delighted that we're back for a second go-round. Um, the number of possible guests from the world of architecture and planning uh, who are both interesting in their ideas and articulate is so enormous that in the short series with which we began this program last year, it was impossible to even scratch the surface. Uh, this year, we're beginning to pick up on people who are of equal importance, who were either unavailable last time uh, or who we didn't, for one reason or another, reach. Uh, one of the people who I most admire, both professionally and personally, in this world is Ed Barnes. So let me add a word of welcome and say how glad I am that you're with us this time since you weren't with us last time. Uh, John Rasquet's introduction gave a good summary of your work, uh, so I won't repeat that. Uh, let me go right into one issue that helps tie this conversation in with the theme that's been the kind of loose theme carrying through both last year's series and this year's, which is the whole idea of the city. Uh, we're not limited in any way, and I hope you will not be limited in your questions later on uh, on issues of New York and the city, but it is kind of our central theme and what we begin with and take off from. Uh, Ed Barnes is an architect who's always practiced in New York uh, but until the last few years, had not done any major work here in Manhattan. Now the city is, is filled with his work. Uh, let me begin then with a, with a question about New York. Uh, why did you choose to come here and practice? Were you frustrated by many years of, of great success and acclaim, but not a great deal of work here in your home city? And how have you reacted to the fact that now you have substantial major commissions in New York? Well, I think... I um, figure we'll start with that before we talk about specific buildings. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's very nice to be here with you, Paul. Thank you for Thank those you. things. Um, I, I came to New York from California for uh, uh, family reasons after the war. I was a naval architect during the war and came back. And um, I had worked uh, for, uh, on a prefabricated house for consolidated Volte aircraft out west. and. And I thought, I was quite young, and I thought the thing to do when you get to New York is to ask a tremendous salary. And no one will know the difference because you've come a long way across the country, and who's to know what you were making on the West Coast? So I find myself at home between job interviews with no job for a long, long time. And after about uh, four or five months of this, one of, my, uh, one of our friends uh, asked if uh, I would um, remodel his kitchen, and, uh, <laughs> and I had absolutely no intention of opening an office, but uh, that's the, 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 I really got sort of pushed off the springboard without making any decision. So that's, that's really a, a, the best I can give you for mm -hmm. why I'm here and why I'm stuck here. <laughs> and then you just never left. No. What <laughs> <laughs> well, um, what, it, what about the nature of practice here? Uh, for many years, as I said, you, like so many distinguished architects in this city, spent a lot of time on airplanes. Uh, now you have an enormous amount of very major work in New York. Uh, do you feel that a New York-based architect brings a particular kind of perception to New York work that others do not have? Well, I think New York work is, is a very... Uh, different from work in other cities. That's the, what that I'm getting is, at. That okay. is the, for sure. 
one thing that happened to me when we came to New York, we can talk about later, when he started working in the city, I mean, doing mm -hmm. jobs in the city, was to suddenly have to cope with a, an enormous change in scale. And I have always been uh, interested in small scale and human scale, and uh, all of a sudden I found myself faced with these problems, which I'm sure there'll be questions about, mm -hmm. the leap in scale in, uh, working in the city. And the second thing was the process, the community boards and the night meetings and the, and the, the, the work it takes to get something done here. Um, and I've, I have to say that, the, that no other city have I seen the kind of dedication and love of a city that you see evidenced all over in the community boards. Whether they're giving you a good time or a bad time, they are doing it for no pay in the evening several times a week. And it seems to me extraordinary that the same people continue year in, year out um, doing this. Uh, that process of getting something built in New York is far more complex. And in a sense, I believe that in every job, there is an interaction between the client and the design. It isn't just something the architect pulls out, but the design and the client uh, are meshed just as the architect and the design are meshed. And so if you find yourself working with a community board, you find that in some way the building begins to respond to the, to the nature of New York City. Is that a way of saying that buildings built in New York are often like that old line about a camel being a horse designed by a committee? That I mean, has do we, happened. Do we that produce a lot happened. of camels in New York or do we produce a lot of horses? Yes, that, that definitely happens. You, you, uh, you may... Um, you get uh, things added in which are not part of a, of a composition that are just absolutely anachronistic. And since there is a fashion these days uh, for pluralism, nobody seems to mind, but I mind. And I think that the, um, uh, what we would like to have is jobs which are um, integrated of a piece. And no matter, from, uh, uh, no matter what is put in the, in the, on the table, uh, that somehow you digest it. And, uh, and it all becomes part of the design. That's quite complex with some of the suggestions that come through from the City Planning Commission or the client or the community board. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You always, it seemed to me, had a, there, there's one curious paradox in, in, in your practice, which is that in one sense you seem very tied in to your own beginnings with Gropius and Breuer and, and Harvard back in the uh, 40s and with a certain belief in the integrity of, uh, not of pure functionalism, but of a certain kind of primal geometric modernism. And yet some of your buildings, like the Haystack School, which John Rusquet mentioned, certain other shingled houses from the early 60s, have always seemed to me to be among the most influential buildings for a younger generation of architects that's been going in a different direction, in that they, uh, they have broken away in certain crucial ways from, uh, from Breuer and Gropius mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, and it, it has seemed to me in some ways as though uh, while there are architects who uh, talk in a radical way and whose work is in fact more conservative and more timid and more tame, sometimes I've almost sensed you were the other way around, that, that you talk in a, in a more cautious way and yet your actual work seems to be more adventurous than that. Is that a fair generalization or not? Well, that's a nice compliment, I think. <laughs> I, the, I think the, um, what I found myself doing the first uh, years of practice was to get terribly interested in what is broadly called village architecture. Mm -hmm. And that is um, <clears throat> breaking up a building into pieces and, it, and reveling in it, breaking up a house into separate elements, um, generally breaking the scale down. If you just simply, I remember the first time I thought this house is really a village, which was a long time ago, what an exciting idea it seemed to me to be building a little village with separate detached units and spaces in between. And um, I've always liked that. Now the question, of course, is how can you possibly take that contextual approach, which, um, which has to do with the, the uh, breaking the scale and using indigenous materials the, of, the, of the surrounding uh, neighborhood, and apply that to a skyscraper in the city? 
It's a fair question. That, that, that the, the, my, if, if there was something which I was pushing, which was, which was ahead of its time, it would have been both contextualism, that is uh, uh, joining and gluing the building onto the neighborhood, whether it's a school or a house or a college building or something, and, and not breaking scale, and, and, uh, and indeed breaking it down into separate little elements, detached units. Um, and I think that's one of the central problems in uh, building a, a great big skyscraper um, is not to just do so much graph paper and to, uh, to, and to maintain this, this uh, connection with the street and with the human scale. And um, we should talk more about that. I think that's a very central problem in the in design of big buildings. Absolutely. Let's talk more about it. <laughs> okay. Um, you've done one very large skyscraper in New York, IBM at 57th and Madison, one medium-sized one, 535 Madison, and you have two very big ones that are just now commencing. Mm -hmm. uh, the building at 53rd and Lex, south of Citicorp, and the new Equitable headquarters on 7th Avenue, which is under construction. Uh, why don't I, before I say anything, why don't you tell me something about, and tell, tell us all, something about those designs and what you were trying to do there? Well, I think the, um, um, the IBM building <clears throat> is, was essentially, um, um, a, a number of these diverse influences that I spoke of were put into the computer, and I think uh, a, a unified design comes out. It's extremely important to me that um, the architecture is all of a piece, and somehow um, that there is a, uh, it's hard for me to be a, a eclectic or pluralist um, in a random way. And my instinct as a designer and through training is to think of architecture as a unified form. Um, in the case of the IBM building, there are a number of ideas which are brought together. Uh, uh, one is the idea of a diagonal entrance. That was the, the, um, the ancient uh, home of IBM, that corner. And it seemed to me that as in banking houses, J.P. Morgan or the Bank of England or, or uh, churches in Rome, this was the place for a diagonal corner entrance. And, and another idea was that, they, that this, the building should cling to the street. Now that was the fashion and is still the fashion in the city planning commission and the community boards that the street wall, so-called, and the retail wall must be enlivened, that it shouldn't set back um, so that a second urban idea was that the, that the building should not set back as they do on 6th Avenue, but should enliven the street, which puts the empty space in back on the mid-block. So a third notion was that the mid-blocks in New York generally should not be built up, that the high buildings should be on the avenues and the low buildings on the, uh, in the, on the streets, something I still believe very much in. Now these ideas produced a building which was cut like a triangle and pushed forward and a park in back covered greenhouse park which is the collecting point for all the circulation and the open space. And so the form of the building which is really this prismatic triangular form with a cut corner entrance is based on some sort of city circulation which is tied in ultimately to the Trump Tower and into the AT&T building. Um, I think of the building as being responsive to about four blocks of movement of, of, of a pedestrian traffic and of that uh, form being expressed in the sky, in the, in the shape of the building and the angles and the dynamics of the building, the, the directions it's pointing and the directions it's uh, welcoming. Um, the Klein Tower also uh, is a building which has a, a, a responsive to the movement on the street. It also is a prisma, is a pure form with slices cut out of it, a, a um, sculptural um, uh, device which appeals to me very much that you, that you uh, um, work with a hypothetical form and then cut slices out of the building uh, um, so that you have a porch and, and, a, and a terrace on the roof of the Klein Tower. The, the big one we're doing on the west side now is still on the boards, big, big job for equitable, 
and that one responds to the new zoning, and in that one we're playing with a top, a, a, a special top on the building, which uh, we haven't in the other two buildings. Well, the Klein Tower has a top. But these, none of these buildings um, represent uh, eclecticism, I think. I think they all represent a kind of uh, uh, direct, uh, in the direct tradition of uh, modern architecture, uh, straightforward analysis of the of the structural frame and the and the floors, and the and, and I, I would put them in the mainstream of modern architecture. I'm sure you would too. Yeah, in fact, I think they're more modernist in a way than say the work of Kevin Roche, who will be here in two weeks. Uh, in something like United Nations Plaza mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hotel at 44th and 1st, uh, which in one sense is, is, is very modernist in its imagery because it's so sleek and full of reflective glass, and yet because the ins and outs and the nips and tucks and the diagonals there are much more arbitrary and are much more designed for pure visual pleasure, mm -hmm. almost mm -hmm. picturesqueness, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's in a sense less modern. Mm -hmm. um, your buildings are certainly not picturesque in that mm -hmm, sense. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the diagonals are, are much more rational. They seem mm -hmm. to each, each slice has a, uh, an ordered purpose. Mm -hmm. There doesn't seem to be a sense that let's slice a little here, let's take a little in here because it looks nice, and a little in there because it looks yeah. nice. Um, yet, uh, I have two questions about, about that. One is that do you feel there's anything ethically or morally wrong with a more picturesque modernism of the sort that, say, Kevin Roche uses, or a picturesqueness even if it's more eclectic. Uh, the other part of my question yeah. is, since you've talked so much about context, I wonder if there isn't a kind of an inconsistency between the desire to make it a pure and perfect whole object and the desire to respond to context. I mean, can we ever do both of those? Certainly at the Asia Society, your museum at 70th and Park, uh, you allowed context to determine the form of that building and make it very much not a pure and perfect form. It has a very largely scaled Park Avenue facade, and then it all steps back to the more delicate scale of the side street. And whatever else one might say about that building, it is certainly not does not read as a single pure object. It's a, a number of disparate parts that come together enough to, to be clearly this, a single building, but do not come together in the total way that the parts of IBM or the Klein Tower at 535 Madison or certain other buildings do. So two questions, really. One is, um, how do we resolve this dichotomy between contextualism and the drive for a pure form and the second question is, is there anything really wrong with being a little bit arbitrary and picturesque? No, I don't think there's anything wrong with being arbitrary and picturesque at all, if, if it works. I think the, um, right. it can be um, just very shallow. I like the UN Hotel very much. Um, I find the, um, the that is, however, uh, in, in my way of thinking, falls into this category of graph paper buildings, mm -hmm. in which you don't understand quite what's up there. It's, no, you can't be, read it at all. Can't read yeah. it. Yeah. And I have, um, I have the feeling that part of the things I haven't been able to translate from my early work into offices I'd like to would be this uh, sense of scale. For example, I don't like using uh, mirrored glass on the street. I like um, clear glass on the street. I like to have uh, the, see the structure at the street level. I like to see the, the scale of that. I don't like the look of a black building just coming down to the street and scaleless. And, and I think we all know that Steinberg cartoon, which is a piece of graph paper, and all he drew was a doorman at the bottom and two little television masts at the top, and it looks exactly like a, one of these buildings. The so that I I think the the if the interesting thing about Kevin's work is it is um, this it does have this capricious, uh, irrational quality, and as, as that is as a foil against this highly impersonal, passive, uh, scaleless um, right. attitude toward the facade. And it's a, uh, I think it, um, 
uh, I have to say that in my work, I haven't been as capricious except after the Asian Society and some smaller work. And, um, but on the other hand, the sense of place of the street and halfway up the building at the top is, is uh, much more evident, the sense of scale and place. You, you've also made almost a trademark out of uh, horizontal bands of windows in your high-rise buildings. Uh, unless I've missed something, every one of them has that. If, they don't, if they're not uninterrupted, at, uh, they still are predominantly horizontal, as at the New England Merchants in that mm -hmm. National Bank yeah, in yeah. Boston, your first uh, high-rise building. Why is that? What, what attracts you to that particular form, which, which is more than just a way to make windows, because of course it, it, uh, those horizontal bands ultimately really determine the whole nature of the facade. Yes, I think I, currently we're doing a building which it doesn't have that. We're doing an office building which has got punch windows and um, the, uh, with all the difference that that implies. The logic of horizontal windows um, in terms of loft space is very clear. That, mm -hmm. And it, insofar as you are building a loft building, uh, like a, f I don't want to, to uh, scare people, but essentially a, uh, there's something highly impersonal about a, about a office building. And there's something... Oh, uh, I suspect uh, most people have figured that out on their own. Right. <laughs> and I think that the uh, Chicago style, which was at one time admired by everybody of, of architecture, uh, which includes Mies van der Rohe, has this uh, highly uh, uh, developed logic about what an office building is. An office building is a place where you have windows and desks and the windows, if they're ribbon windows, you get better working light and all of that. Um, and I think that uh, to the extent that I still have the feeling that an office building is, has a, is a working machine, a place to work, uh, I'm drawn toward having plenty of daylight. Um, but I am, but I, this, you'll have to see this building, building in Providence where it's quite different, mm -hmm. where we're working uh, with uh, uh, a, a module which produces square windows. Because mm -hmm. if we talk about the shortcoming of a, a graph paper building or a certain perhaps more capricious kind of building is not allowing you to read enough mm -hmm. from the outside. You don't know where the floors begin and end or anything mm -hmm. else. In a certain sense, the ribbon window also denies you a sense of, of, structure. of structure and of where certain things begin and end and where the columns come down and, and all of that. So in a sense, it's a little bit disingenuous to sort of talk about it as being completely honest in that it, well, it too, I, is an I, arbitrary decision. I think that if you think about it, you will find what I spoke about, Kevin, true in, with, in a number of architects. There's, each makes his decision about, you called it nips and tucks, and I talked about humanizing the first floor. Each makes these gestures which are frivolous or capricious or, and also has, if, if he's a, a architect doing office buildings, there is a kind of logic too, which he, which he has to because the building is like that. And uh, in my case, the building on Madison Avenue, the Klein building, I tried as hard as I could. We worked in the office as hard as we could to have the aluminum, uh, which, which will be, um, which is a kind of a, a, a ice-colored uh, metallic finish, sort of a Mercedes-Benz ice-colored metallic, as close as possible to the mirrored uh, green glass. And we spent all our time, and when you look at that building, sometimes the spandrels look lighter and sometimes they look darker. It's, it's actually just, it's, it's always like a snake skin, that there, as much as possible to make these two materials look alike. So you can say, well, how does that add up with your idea that a building should be interesting and human and so on? I think there are these choices, and some things in the building are highly human uh, and, uh, and, or highly interesting, and some things are, tend to be uh, disciplined. You did anticipate, in fact, part of, part of, part of my next question, because I, I sensed in something you said a minute or two ago. You were almost equating humanizing gestures with being capricious. Hmm. Um, I mean, if we carry that to its logical conclusion, then the pure and proper and ideal building is also the least human. You mean that Mies van der Rohe would be, would be the pure, pure and proper? Sure, uh, I guess we could, building. although I wasn't human. thinking of Mies in particular, <laughs> but, but we could, for the purposes of conversation, say that, sure. Well, I think the way... I mean, is it a compromise of the ideal to humanize a building? No, I don't, don't, didn't mean it that way. Okay. 
Um, I like the idea that being human is being capricious. That sounds sort of okay. nice, don't you? But, uh, <laughs> um, but I, essentially, I think this question of scale is, is, uh, interests me. I don't think I've solved it. I'm very interested in, in, the, in the way the scale is the building meets the ground. I suppose that um, Michelangelo or something like that is a good place to start, where you have several different orders, a door, an order which is built around the door, and, the, and then another order, which is the first two floors, and then the whole facade. And, and you can, and the scale is brought down from an enormous building, down, 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 till finally there's a, a bench that you can sit on at the bottom of the building on the square. We don't do anything like that. Our buildings um, have all of that going on. There are all of those possibilities in the entrance and the, and the uh, bottom 40 or 50 feet of a building for slowing the scale down of somehow taking this tremendous rush of, of, of construction and bringing it down the street in an interesting way. Now, I don't think that's capricious. I think that really is a kind of architectural sophistication. And I don't think it's, it's the exclusive right of the, of the uh, modernists or the postmodernists. I think there's bad modern architecture, bad postmodern architecture. The question is, does, it, does the building, um, does this question of scale, which is a way to mediate between the person and the, and the, the enormous weight and mass of the building, who is handling that well? Um, How do you feel you handled that at IBM? Because in fact, I think the problem I have with IBM, I suppose, is, is most completely one of scale. <laughs> that I, I find it yeah. is, um, uh, and for me, a proof of that is that I liked the building less when it was really there in its full 43-story uh, reality than I did in model form right. early on. Because in fact, scale is one of the hardest things to pick up uh, when a building is in model form. Um, how do you feel you've dealt with these issues of scale in that largest of your buildings? Well, <clears throat> oddly enough, I, I think that I did very well. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> we're not supposed to, we're not here to agree necessarily. So. Um, mm. No, if you look, <clears throat> you will we'll see at the bottom of the building all kinds of things going on. The <clears throat> um, there is a two-story uh, shop front with a mezzanine floor with clear glass, <clears throat> which is undulating in and out. That goes up about 25 feet. And then there's an entrance, which goes up uh, uh, some 60 feet. And then you go back into the greenhouse that goes up to 80. And you have these, uh, these are all <clears throat> heights, which one leads to the other. And I think at the bottom of the building is an awful lot going on, which brings the scale down to the, to the uh, uh, human level, the taking the corners off um, to me was terribly important. I think the I know you felt the loss of that column, but I think the um, uh, the notion that you that you were going to do a corner entrance, and again I refer you to a number of historical buildings mm -hmm. where you do enter on the corner and there's no column. Um, the notion that that dynamic was going to be uh, applied to this form, it seemed to me was a very uh, exciting one. And in fact, when I walk around the corner there, I have a great sense of release that suddenly the space opens up and, this, and I don't know why this, the, the corner seems big and yet the building is holding the corner in the sense of a street wall and the building it does define the corner of Madison and, and um, 57th in a, in a clean, hard way, yet there's somehow magically all the space underneath. I like it. Then I think the... Um, I think it has directly to do with uh, the people, uh, the, the, all kinds of monkey business to bring it down to the, something that people can understand. I guess I, I feel like I want to keep saying yes, but <laughs> over right. and over again, because for me, the, um, you know, those buildings that have successfully used diagonal entrances have not then proceeded to go up for 43 stories. Uh, I mean, the, the Morgan Bank, for example, which, which, is, which is a a lovely building, the Trowbridge and Livingston Bank at Broad and Wall. Um, it's wonderful, yeah. but it really is a great banking hall. And the tower, such as it is, it's really more of a mass, is all half a block behind it. Uh, so that if, uh, if IBM had in fact chosen to build a great sort of, uh, its great computer sales room as if it were a huge bank, as a nearly freestanding element on the corner and put the tower back, 
would be one thing. Um, but uh, I can see the problem that, that I've always felt perhaps you kind of almost back, I don't mean to say painted yourself into a corner, but um, in the sense of uh, wanting the corner entrance and the diagonal entrance, and yet wanting to anchor the corner, uh, which is a, an admirable urban aim, yet the only way to do it is then through that cantilever, and this enormous amount of mass, mass and weight is all hanging over that corner, which for me always seemed a little bit disconcerting and, and disproportionate. Um, the other thing is the shape of that building is interesting in floor plan. Uh, that, fi that prism, as you've described it, yet the way in which the entire, one of the other prices one pays by anchoring the corner and bringing the mass out to the corner of 57th and Madison is that from the way most people will see that building, you don't really see how interesting the shape is. You see the two long sides making a 90 degree angle. And in fact, most people approaching it from that corner assume that the whole thing is just a big square box. I think that you tend to read two invisible other sides, even though, in fact, I'm sorry, you can't see the little pictures I'm drawing with my finger on the tablecloth. Uh, even though, in fact, the form is much less intimidating in reality than it appears to be from that corner, because it's, in fact, a smaller and more interesting shape. So my sense is that the corner entrance, which is perhaps nice, created a larger problem than it solved, in that it, it created the sense of just so much heavy mass on the corner, you began to read the building as if it were an enormous square box going up, shaft, square shaft or slab, rather than the actual, actually more slender and unusual shape that it truly is. You don't really see, because nobody sees the building very much from the southwest, which is where you read the shape best. Well, um, I think if you stand where I like to look at that building, it's to, stand, it's to walk down Madison and look at it when the cantilever is most extreme. Yeah. To me, the cutting away of the bottom of the building and then seeing it br branch out is quite an extraordinary uh, structural statement. And um, I think when, when architects are using high-tech skin, all over the place, whether it's mirrored glass or, or black glass, or in this case, using polished stone and glass, right. green stone and green glass to, to get something close. And a high-tech skin is essentially a expression of weightlessness. Um, the, the, the whole essence of, of, a, of these skin buildings is that the building is weightless. And that is the aesthetic of the building. And I think, um, it, I must say, when this building was being built and I saw the, the structure, I was uh, thought of the time, maybe 30 years before, in architectural school when um, muscular buildings with, with heavy construction and so on were in, and where people wanted to express every bit of structure they could. It would be that Corbusier's late years and the fallout of that was that if you had a chance to show some structure, you'd show it. and. Um, I saw that, that the structure was extremely interesting. I don't know whether you remember it at the that great time. Trust, the trust, the support of the cantilever. Sure, right. I remember it. Yeah. And um, uh, and but the fact is, the expression of the skin is volumetric expression in which all of a sudden the building just seems to be weightless. Um, uh, and for that reason, I don't find the uh, cantilever heavy. I, I find the cantilever in keep as weightless as, let us say the cantilever on a little broyer house uh, that, that he did when I was in school, which is a little box, like a cigar box, on a, on a, just set on a little stone pedestal, um, also seemed to be absolutely weightless, even though it's, a, it's the same exact aesthetic. The skin and the truss is covered up with the, with the ordinary sheathing. Um, but it's, 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 you know, your eyes see it one way, I see it the sure. other. Well, let me, uh, that prompts yet another question, and, and soon we will indeed move on to other buildings. But since this is so conspicuous and so important, um, it's hard not to ask one more question, which is if the idea is, of, is a high-tech skin with the appearance of weightlessness, why then use granite? Isn't the very nature of stone the appearance, the, the sense of mass and weight? And isn't, if one is going to be a modernist, isn't 
sort of integrity of materials, in a sense, their, that great modernist precept, in a sense being violated by using stone as if it were a very different kind of material. That's a good criticism. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because uh, I think that that is, that's one reason I've always been much more comfortable with the Klein, with the Klein yeah. building at 54th and Madison, which of course in so many ways is aesthetically doing similar yeah. things, yeah. but there is a high-tech skin that has its heart in high-tech, mm -hmm. um, in that it is, it is a very beautiful metal rather than uh, stone, which to me seems to be trying to pretend it's metal. No, I think that it, that's a very sensitive and exactly right. The way stone is so often used these days is to pretend it's metal. And actually, the stone that you see on buildings is sometimes only an inch and an eighth thick right, or something. Right. It practically is metal. But still, stone is stone. And I think that you're right. In terms of, if it's to anybody's interest, there's a tremendous reason to um, do a building which is all metal and glass. And that is, it's, all, it's almost a a um, catalog item. It, it, it comes under one contractor, he provides everything. Uh, the architect doesn't do much. The architect draws the sort of the, the, the proportions of the windows and things and then sits down with the person who's going to build the building and works out the details with him. It's, uh, it's really a mass-produced, the most mass-produced architecture we have almost. So these uh, entire skin walls all is done by one contractor. When you use stone, you complicate things. You have two contractors. And if there's a leak between the stone and the window, nobody knows who's responsible. And so that the stone, and I know there's some people here that I've worked with in the, in the audience, and they would absolutely agree with me that the simplest, most straightforward thing is the high-tech skin. Um, Yet the, the Klein building, while it certainly fits what you've just yeah. said, is hardly a sort of an off-the-rack, oh, no. the catalog skin. It was as carefully designed and detailed as any as the IBM skin. It, it is know. true, but just the same, I think that uh, Arthur Drexler in that Transformations book um, pointed out a number of, of uh, fairly anonymous architects doing very sophisticated uh, high-tech skins, and that's all because of the state of the art. Yeah. It's a very interesting part of architecture, which... Uh, right. Good. On the Klein building, um, why, since you've been so vocal in explaining why you did not want a column supporting the cantilever at IBM, why in a fairly similar form with a, a diagonal entrance and the corner, the entire uh, height of the tower, save for the couple of stories of the entrance, uh, cantilevered out over it or projecting out over it, why this time is there a column? Well, I hope everybody in this room will go look at these two plazas <laughs> because I feel the Klein building, uh, the column is reinforcing the, the street wall. The column and the size of the column, which is bigger than it need be, uh, is part of the facade. It's just defining the sidewalk. And the, the, uh, the column is used as a way to slice past the building into the park from a circulation point of view. Um, the, that, that building, if those who don't know it, has a little pocket park on one side. And the, it, there is not a symmetrical diagonal entrance from the corner. You walk along the sidewalk and turn in. You don't, as in the case of, of uh, the IBM building, walk in from every direction in to a diagonal. So I think the, uh, my feeling was that it was absolutely right. We studied it both ways, and it was engineered both ways. But we felt, uh, and if this was the cheapest way, of course, and we felt this was uh, by far the, the, the right thing to do on that street simply because you don't approach it on a diagonal. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, are there similar things going to happen in the uh, Lexington Avenue building and the uh, Equitable? Well, they both those buildings respond to the new, uh, the new zoning and the new setback rules, mm -hmm. which whether uh, I happen to think that the, what's going on at the tops of buildings is very healthy. And, um, and both these buildings, uh, we are doing bit tops which are not, which are much more capricious than the, uh, <laughs> than the uh, tops on the other buildings. The, um, the, the, client, the, the, the one on uh, Lexington that you referred to is also going to be uh, a building in which you slice pieces off and you end up with a top which is all uh, cut away till there's nothing but a triangle left. 
And um, I think that kind of, a, 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 it, there'll be several tiers of, of slices taken off the top of this thing. And I think it, it's gonna be quite interesting. Building next to Citicorp must be a particularly difficult issue, particularly in terms of context. Yes, I think the city core is a, 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 an enormous blockbuster of a building. But to put a building next to it, how would you how would you put a top on it? I mean, uh, what kind? How do you cope with that? And um, what we've tried to do is to do something which is a foil and doesn't attempt to compete. It's much lower, but it's higher than Seagram's, and it has to relate to these, uh, these several important buildings in different different directions. And can, this is the most contextual building we've done in the sense that each of these terraces, as you slice off the top of the building, lines up with adjacent buildings. Uh, one terrace is sliced off here, and the terrace lines up with Seagram's, and another slice is, lines up with another building. So that the, it is quite contextual in the sense of uh, the stepping back, lining up with the setbacks on adjoining buildings. Okay. Let's move away from high-rise buildings for just a moment. Uh, before we do that, uh, let me, issue the sort of weekly call for questions. We'll talk for another few minutes, but uh, let me just remind those of you who want to write out questions and haven't yet, now is the time and the ushers will collect them in, in another little while. We will switch to our second mode and uh, <laughs> present some of your, your thoughts. Um, you've done a great, you've had, it seems to me, two subspecialties after high rise or even Chronologically, I suppose we should say before high-rise buildings, campus planning is one, and art museums are another. Uh, one of your art museums is the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis of 1971, that uh, is considered one of the great and surely most completely successful museums for the display of contemporary art in the country, uh, a museum that even even critics who don't like IBM absolutely adore. Um, and you are about to open uh, the New Museum of Fine Arts in Dallas, which is one of the major new museums in America, which will be open formally this January. Uh, can you tell us something about being an architect who clearly has a very strong sense of his own work and does not take any pleasure in designing neutral background buildings, and the dilemma of housing not only contemporary art, but any art, really, and making it making a civilized place that serves the needs of art. Well, I think that um, it, it is true that one of the most important things in any museum collection is the envelope, uh, and an architect any architect taking on a museum figures he's adding a work of art to the, uh, to the museum collection. But at the same time, it seems to me he has a, a, has a duty to do this, to make this work of art mate with what's inside. It doesn't mean that it has to be absolutely anonymous. And it's a, it's a very subtle thing. Um, I'm sure you all know what, I, what I'm talking about. You may have seen museums with, uh, I'll make up a combination of museums with a corrugated uh, concrete wall that you're supposed to hang pictures on. I'm thinking of a museum out west. Or a, a, a museum which has uh, uh, skylights with sun streaking in while you're trying to look at pictures. Or a museum which is very, very active, lots of openings, balconies, and this kind of thing. Or and even a certain museum with a spiral ramp, which uh, <laughs> I'm sure if the audience doesn't know the examples you're bringing yeah. up, they certainly that's a, know. That's a, absolutely. So the, um, I think that it is possible to do a succession of spaces which are, uh, which are beautifully proportioned and where the light is right and where the art looks wonderful. And I think that's the, that is the object. Of a, that's what a, a museum architect is supposed to be doing. Um, if you have to, if you started with what a gallery person would like to sell art, he would like a, a Soho-like loft, painted white, um, and uh, probably he'd cut out the daylight, or have very little day daylight, so the paintings just look wonderful and sell like hotcakes. Essentially, 
They want as little to compete with the art as possible. They do like high ceilings and they like space and they like it, uh, to proper distance and good proportions, but they don't want the architecture competing. My own view is that if you start adding things into that commercial gallery space, the first thing you do is to add daylight. And one of the things that's uh, uh, most fun, I think, in museum design is to add daylight through leaking it in around, the, around on the sides of the room or occasional vistas into a courtyards and this kind of thing. I don't find that competitive uh, myself with the art. I think that it helps it and I think that the, uh, so that the, the architecture has to have the right volume, the right space, the right proportions and the right handling of daylight. And the third ingredient is that it has to be, um, you have to have the right flow I think that uh, the circulation in a museum is uh, more important than the, the flow is more important than the form in some way. And um, I think that you can only, you only have to think of museums where you, you go and backtrack and can't find your way around and other museums where you do somehow get wafted through the museum and out. Um, we can all learn a lot from Walt Disney when it comes to handling people and every museum has a storyline and, the, and this is not form, this is flow. And the architect then has to handle the volume, the daylight, and the flow, and all of these things done subtly. Um, and I don't think all museum architects do that. No, relatively few. In fact. Yeah. Um, are you optimistic about the Dallas Museum? I think it's gonna be pretty good. We, uh, they're moving the uh, paintings and sculpture in now and beginning to see what things are gonna look like. And uh, I think they're going to look wonderful. What is the, it's a, I know it's a limestone building with a central yeah. vaulted space. What is, how would you describe what you're trying to do there? They have a, a very diverse collection and that, and I felt that the, um, rather than, um, and they felt too, that we would try to take, break the collection into almost three house museums. One is a museum for contemporary works. And one is a museum for um, uh, European art, uh, 19th century and, and tw early 20th century art. And one is for ethnic work, African work and uh, uh, Mexican, South American. These are so different. They're almost like different house museums. And so the, bu the building is, is arranged on terraces. And each one of these house museums is a little tray, not so little, big as a tennis court, something like that. And then you go up a few steps to the next tray and to the next tray, so that you have a composition which relates directly to the to the subject matter, um, as we did in, a, in an Indian museum in Santa Fe, where we tried to relate the uh, the shape of the museum to the content of the, of the of the material. I think that I think that'll be evident when you're in it. That you feel that you're going from from one kind of a building in uh, buildings within buildings. What about, what about campuses? Uh, you, well, you've, <laughs> you've done several of those. I suppose purchase is the most uh, noted and the one our audience here yes. knows best. Well, I think that um, uh, purchase, purchase is, um, was an, an experiment in a way. It was an attempt to, to uh, give some guide rules to uh, some 10 or 12 architects and arrive at a, common, at a common form that would all hang together and still have the diversity that you get from different architects. And my job was to, uh, to do the campus plan, the sort of armature in which, to which all these uh, buildings would be attached. And um, I think the, um, the actual plan works pretty well. It's a, it's a, uh, a pedestrian precinct to which all the academic buildings connect and, and the uh, services and everything are provided to all the buildings underground. Um, it's a campus with the, where the center is empty, which is sort of nice, and the, and the buildings are arranged around the outside. It's a campus which has a form idea. When I spoke earlier that I believe that every building, like the IBM building and other things, has to have a sort of a central idea behind the whole thing. It doesn't always happen with campuses, but this campus is one of the handful in the country where you actually could um, understand the plan in an academic sense, uh, the way the buildings relate to each other. Once 
That was the that was the rigid part. Then any architect could build a building any length, any height, whatever he wanted around this central campus. As long as it stayed within brick, too. Yeah, it yeah. was the, that That's was the, the other brick, yeah. which in fact one of our questions asks about. How much was Thomas Jefferson in your mind when you were doing that? Oh, I was yeah. very much uh, aware of that of the Thomas Jefferson campus. The original purchase design, the library was most of it underground with a stacks and everything underground and a tiny little pavilion in the open, open central space. As the, as the plan was developed, that library began to emerge out of ground. It got bigger and bigger and bigger. So I think that as it's somewhere along the line, the, the analogy to Charlottesville was lost when the library right. consumed too much of the central space. Yeah, no, that, I've always thought, in fact, that uh, it is more successful the less we think of it in those terms yes. because of the mass of that central building, building there. Um, we have uh, enough questions to keep us going into next week, uh, so let me apologize in advance if yours is not one of the ones we get to. Um, if you were to move your office to the 56th in Madison Corner, would you move into AT&T, Trump, or IBM? <laughs> uh, we might as well start with that, just because I'd like to hear what you say, too. Well, that's a tough one, because if I moved... It's such an easy one, because, in fact, there's really no, no space for rent. In, you see, if I, moved in, uh, uh, if I moved into uh, uh, IBM, I'd have to look at the other buildings. And if I moved into the other buildings, I could look at that. <laughs> so you, that uh, helps begin to answer another question, um, which is permitted here since we have uh, no strictures about uh, in this room about any uh, uh, professional hesitancy about commenting on one's colleague. Uh, what <laughs> what do you think of the AT and T building? Well, I I really like the idea that architects are starting to do funny tops, and that is certainly a funny top. And um, I, th I think that I like that, and I'm waiting to see what the bottom is like. I think that's, it's, it's very, it's extremely uh, uh, spacious. It's, a, uh, it's marvelous, uh, huge spaces. There's a wonderful through block gallery and all of that. So the, both the top and the bottom I, I, I endorse. If one thing that I don't like, I don't think that uh, the architect had much to do with, the actual bulk on that, on that is, above, uh, is above the, exceeded what was lawful. I think that in the trade-off with the city to get the building built there, AT&T asked for coverage of something, of, of the tower, tower coverage of something like 55 or 58 percent the legal coverage is 40%. So that you start out with exceeding the city coverage requirement. That tower is just, has more horizontal bulk. Second, to compound that, something which wasn't illegal, but with the two together made quite a difference, it was decided to have very, very high floor heights. Um, so that the combination of building very, very high floor heights and covering close to 60% of the lot instead of the legal 40%, has produced, produced a, an enormous building. Now, I think, I think that one does sense proportions of buildings, and I, and I think that that building is, is, is bulky. You have to think of a building sometimes in moonlight when you don't see the details, um, and, and the mass of a building has to look well in moonlight. Um, and I think that... Um, a building which we all know has got some magic about it is, is the Seagram's building, and I'm talking about the proportions of the form. Um, so my problem with that building is, from a, from a urban point of view, and before I, the architect got started, the, the, there was a trade-off on plain coverage, uh, which makes the building very bulky. It's pretty big. There's no yeah, no question about it. Um, question about IBM. Um, why such an open, almost Spartan-looking appearance in your IBM atrium? Why the bamboo plantings? Well, um, the bamboo was, it was, a, uh, it was an experiment, and we're still working with the New York Botanical Garden on that experiment. It's, um, 
we wanted to get something which was high, which would go up to the height of the restaurant. And we spent a great deal of time going to uh, the south to find the bamboo and, and uh, bring it up. It's been, I thought, in fact, IBM thought that bamboo was virulent, that actually you had to be afraid of it, that it would uh, tear up the paving and uh, take over. Uh, far from it. it. Turns out that bamboo uh, in the, it has to be taken care of very carefully. It's now growing and, and uh, prospering. The, um, the park itself is quiet compared to City Corp, compared to perhaps what Holly White and the people who are interested in action would like. But I wonder if that isn't nice to come out of um, Trump, which is a commercial sort of pink uh, uh, perfume box with lots of uh, <laughs> action, to, and then to suddenly come into this cool, green, and somewhat uh, quiet space, and then go from there to what will be a totally different kind of space when the, when the AT&T building opens up, and that'll all be another kind of thing. I think the fact that this is a, is a slightly quiet haven is a great, um, it, it's very restful. And I'm glad there's not uh, a lot of action and the smell of mustard and all the rest that goes with it. I was actually there today at lunchtime. Mm -hmm. And there, was, there were more people than I'd ever seen before there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it was, in fact, uh, I, was, I liked it better than I have in previous mm -hmm. visits, mm -hmm. just seeing it filled mm -hmm. up. Um, I mean, maybe it was just overflow from the Trump Tower because there are a lot of people Could sitting be. around with shopping bags at the <laughs> table. But, um, and since the, the, the only place to sit and eat in the Trump Tower is smaller than this stage, yeah. um, I suppose a certain amount of it is, is flying over. But in fact, um, it did make a difference. Seeing well, I, I, I think they're going to, just one more thing, they're, they haven't gotten used to the space, but they will be, there will be a banner program. A year from now, I think they have a Northwest Indian show. There'll be totem poles in there. And this not exactly IBM's business running a space like that, but I think that they will be, uh, I know the programs that are coming up, and the space is going to be have continually changing things. Well, in fact, I think which, which, the, which will the be new IBM gallery that's part of the, the yeah. building itself is allowed to sort of overflow into the space, yeah. it will enrich the space. Yeah. Sure, I mean, totem poles is great, or even, you know, changing pieces of sculpture or, any, or anything, anything else. Um, part of what gives the city its human qualities, as noted by Jane Jacobs, is a certain randomness or anarchy in the way individuals settle in or adapt the street level to their own uses. This is in direct contrast to the studied formal rationality you've designed. Would you like to live in a city of unified conceptions, standing one next to the other, a la Brasilia, or is there much to be argued for the role of anarchy in setting and making, making humanly interesting a cityscape? Well, I think there is um, something charming about the, the anarchy in New York. Um, this, um, these clustering of buildings like uh, a messed up uh, chessman on a chessboard all bunched together. And um, it's, it's terribly exciting. But I don't think that, uh, I think at the same time, within each building, and occasionally you have to have these quiet, ordered spaces. They, uh, they make the, the other buildings look interesting, these pauses and, and silences between the, the friction and the rubbing, the elbowing that goes on in New York. I think that, there's a, that the, one of the most successful spaces we all know for people is the Seagram's Plaza. And I think that that interlude, when you come to it from other places on Lexington, is just terrific. So that um, it seems to me that in a city where, where, where what you like is this um, chaos and um, excitement, there's a great need for occasional, occasionally to have quiet spaces. Would you compare the way 101 Park Avenue, which is the building at uh, 40th Street, handled the corner and the way you did at 535 Madison and IBM? Um, well, I, th I don't like to criticize that building. I, I think that the, um, the people in the it audience It is another here, diagonal. It's another point. diagonal. So in fact, it's, a, it's an interesting and provocative question, right. I think. And I don't remember exactly how that diagonal works with the street. Um, I really don't remember. It seems to me the whole corner is sliced off. The, well, the, the entire tower. Rises, on, rises sheer on the diagonal, 
Yeah. And so the, the plaza, in effect, is a triangle mm -hmm. at the corner. And the main facade of the tower faces the corner directly yeah. on a diagonal. It just goes straight up. Um, and then there's sort of little things on the side that are like fins, where it sort of sticks out a little bit. You're, you're probably better at that. I, the thing that, they're not, that is not doing then is defining the street wall high up. No, in fact, it quite, to the contrary, it ignores it. Ignores the street wall. And I think one of the great city spaces in the city is Park Avenue. And I would, uh, as at Asia House and as at other buildings, see no need for angles and things on Park Avenue. I think that Park Avenue is a, this great rectangular hall that goes through the city needs to be maintained. So in that sense... Uh, um, the IBM, would, yeah. if it were on Park Avenue, would maintain it because the right. part that sure. defines it is up there in the sky. So in that sense, philosophically, even though I know this stylistically is not could not be your work, you would be more in accord with the Philip Morris building across the street, which has a very strong and clear street wall. On that side, yes. Yeah. Okay, good. When you design a skyscraper, how long a, a lifespan do you envision for it? Assuming, and I guess this is inevitable this week, assuming the absence of nuclear war, how long, <laughs> how long will or can the IBM building stand? Oh, it's going to it could stand a very long time. It's a, I don't know how to answer that. I don't think we've had a test on steel frame buildings, really. Uh, there's been none that I know that's rusted away or crumbled. Or um, I would say that. Um, well, of course, like, the like oldest the pyramids, of them are still are barely a hundred years old. Yeah, so. yeah. I think they can last as long as the pyramids. The air conditioning might be a little bit out of date. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, where do you think your desire to integrate your earlier village architecture and your more uh, more recent geometric high-rise architecture will take you? I wish I knew. I, I, um, I think that um, it is, in these high-rise buildings, I'm sort of interested in addition to making a humanizing the street, the bottom of the building, to find places up in the building, terraces and things, which uh, you can see from a distance and looks like a place you'd like to walk to, perhaps uh, special windows, terraces and things, um, almost as if you were looking at a mountain and, and, uh, and saw uh, crags or, or ledges that you'd like to sit on. Um, I, I don't know exactly how to do this. I think the tops of the bu buildings and the terraces of the buildings and the bottom of the buildings are places which are just calling for some special treatment. The, the city zoning just says take a building with ordinary ribbon windows and start setting it back in a wedding cake. And my inclination would be to try to get, uh, uh, to take these setbacks as points of departure for architectural special ceiling height, special windows, special treatment. Uh, and I haven't done it yet. <laughs> we can go from that into a, a somewhat similar question that I think is based on uh, some misinformation, but it's an interesting question anyway, so I'll ask it. The new Lexington Avenue YMCA will be next door or across the street from your Lexington Avenue building, yet I assume you don't know its height or setback. How can you, in creating your unified whole, try to anticipate the future as well as your existing neighbors? I believe yeah. this question is referring to the, the Dick Roth building. The, yeah, the Emory Roth building that's rising on the site of the old YMC, the, YWCA, which is in fact not a YWCA, but just a, right. a rather disappointing office building. Um, but the point of the question is still valid, even if you do. Yeah, I think that it's a, we, I called up Dick Roth, Roth and asked him how high his building was, and we don't quite relate. But that, that's what architects should do. Um, you should be aware of what's going around as much as you can. The, the, um, I don't think people used to do that at all, but most architects now are becoming much more aware, much more careful about simply calling up and, uh, the neighbors and seeing what's being built and trying to relate. Um, the the um, way it was in the, in the past, uh, you just didn't pay any attention. You just, in the good old American way, built on your lot, didn't look right or left, and you wouldn't necessarily know if something else was coming up that didn't match or fit. But ideally, there's no reason in, in, the, in the city why you can't know what's going on around you. And yet, for all that we all talk about that today, it seems to me as though a visitor from another city 
coming to 56th and Madison would think that um, Edward Arby Barnes, Philip Johnson, and Der Scott of IBM had all been locked in different rooms, prohibited from <laughs> having any contact whatsoever with each other until their buildings were complete. Now you can't blame um, me because I was there first. Okay, fair, <laughs> fair, fair, fair enough, I suppose. Okay. okay. Um, here's a question that, in fact, relates again to that similar idea. In the equitable building, how is the design complicated or resolved by the fact that an older building at 52nd and 7th is left standing? Yeah, that's a, um, a um, holdout, and the lease has to run out before they can build on that. I think it does complicate Equitable's life. They will have an enormous building with no entrance from 7th, and on 7th is this uh, rundown building with a fast food operation. Um, and um, the, that just sits that way indefinitely. When you have a lease holdout, the, per, the lease, the, the lessee, um, is thinking, I'm just going to hold out forever till they pay my price. Meanwhile, the length of the lease runs out all the time, so that there's a psychological pressure begins to build up. Uh, the, it gets less and less valuable to buy out the lease as the lease runs to, to a, the term gets shorter. And that's the, that's the, the situation there now. Uh, nobody's budging, but for the, for, so for the moment we have an enormous building with a little brick building in front of it, and the only way to get in the building is to sort of walk around the side of the little building. But you will eventually, eventually. demolish that building and complete equitable by the yeah, site. Yeah, eventually that gets taken down and it'll be uh, when the lease runs out or sooner. What is the longest possible time then? When it could run till 1990, I believe, but I think, I think it'll cr cr crumble before that. Yeah. <laughs> So this, this building was not, that building was not built forever then. That no, was no. Come over. Okay. Um, the Vest Pocket Park of the Klein Building enjoys a side street quietness, but wouldn't it have been more functional, people-wise, if the building were 90 degree turned to the left with the leg on the Madison corner? Um. Both the city and George Klein wanted to maximize retail on Madison. Um, they wanted, uh, both the city planning and the community board and everybody wanted a line of shops on, on Madison. That was uh, de rigueur. Also, the place that, I, I insist that the place that needs relief are the side streets, the narrow side streets. And um, you know, the interesting thing about the zoning, uh, the, the first zoning laws that produced all the, the wedding cakes uh, before Seagram's, before the 40% the tower coverage, that what you think of as the old wedding cake buildings, that setback was determined on the width of the street. And if you built on an avenue, you didn't have to set back as much, so you could build an enormous building. It would go up and up and up with very little setback. And if you built on a side street, the setback was so rapid to bring light into the side street that you couldn't build a big building. So that zoning produced a very interesting grain to the city, which I, for one, am sorry is no longer. The grain produced would be that the avenues, which are wide, running north and south, would have high buildings. And the streets, which generally have the remnants of brownstones and so on, would, would be uneconomic to develop and would re remain low. And it gave the whole city a kind of a, a pattern, which uh, was wonderful. That's completely crumbled now, because you can, uh, you're encouraged to build um, uh, uh, street wall buildings on side streets, and, uh, and the side street ambiance is beginning to disappear. They've not yet rented that retail space, have they, in the Klein building? No, for all that everybody wants retail on Madison, there's several buildings with unrented space yeah. still. Yeah, I mean, the market is not infinite. No. For that. Can you give a specific example of a restriction imposed by a community board and the way it was resolved? Well, we had a um, uh, last minute request from the community board on the west side that we were talking about a fountain. And one of the community board members said, said whenever I hear water, I will have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and uh, so they insisted that, they, that the developer, which was equitable, provide bathrooms. Now bathrooms, which are open all day and night forever, in eternity, 
are a security problem. It's not just something you, it's not the cost of the bathroom, it's the whole question of the cleaning and, and everything else that goes with the bathroom. If you can think of bathrooms and stations and things. And so that it was a, there was a long debate. And uh, in the end, we met halfway and put in two bathrooms. <laughs> in other words, the community board got its, got its way and the equitable put the bathrooms in. Uh, that didn't affect the architecture much. I, I was really, uh, it was a question of, um, for equitable to fight out. But the community board had no, as far as I know, they had no right to, to ask for the bathrooms, but they simply could hold up forever arguing for the bathrooms. And it was simpler to do it than, than to not. What can architects do to prevent building gridlock a la 3rd and Madison Avenues in the 40s and 50s. Why did it happen? Corporate ego, question mark. Should the government pre prevent it or did it cause it? Is this, is this a traffic question? That uh, no, I think it, it's a, it, the word gridlock is being used metaphorically. Um, I mean, what, what this is really saying is what can architects do to prevent too much building in an overdeveloped yeah. part of the city? Yeah. I guess everybody knows that it's almost impossible to take away the value of the air rights over a piece of land. If you owned a five-story building and, and uh, somebody could buy that from you and build a 40-story building, that airspace is worth a certain amount of money to you and you will vote no if the city or anybody else tries to say that we're going to downzone that and you can't build anything more than four stories. So it's very hard to imagine reversing the right to build in Midtown. What can be done is through tax incentives and through planning is to try to divert building to other sections. And it's my own view that the, mid, the big problem in Midtown is the, the traffic problem and that, uh, that, that literally could come to a grinding halt, the desirability of being there. It takes so long when you think what people are being paid to get to work, to get from one place to the other, that if another section of the city were well planned uh, in, the, in the good old Burnham, if you will, uh, city planning sense, where you took a new look at traffic, people movement, and public spaces, open spaces, and made a place for office buildings, it could become extremely uh, popular and, um, and could suddenly kill off the desirability to stop midtown development right there. So I think the, the way to uh, uh, stop midtown development and, or downtown development is to have a better idea. And when you think of the plunge in land values when you cross 96th Street, when you think of the, the, of the, of the um, incredible uh, amount of land in the Bronx and uh, in Harlem, which has just looked bombed out like Warsaw. Um, it seems that uh, we have an opportunity here for uh, a massive uh, uh, federal or city planning project which would develop desirable neighborhoods and, and a desirable uh, place for growth. That's the only way I see to do it, is to provide a better alternative. Good, I think we have time for one more. Um, and uh, it will be this. Should buildings be built so that people will be provoked to stop and analyze, or should they be comfortable and familiar to one's eyes? <laughs> I think that the, the, the best art is provocative. I, I think that the... Um, uh, and I think that, that that is the characteristic of, of uh, an advance. It also is a, uh, is a characteristic of something which, is, uh, which could be ugly and could be terrible, it could be shocking and, and undesirable. And uh, so I think that the, simply to do the familiar and the comfortable would be boring if that's all you had. And the, uh, it's proper for architects to risk, designers to risk, and developers to risk. Uh, and put it on the line and experiment and try things um, and um, hope that th th that effort is th the shocking effort which is worthwhile. Does the shocking effort continue to be shocking or does it ultimately become conventional? Uh, then it, all of a sudden it becomes familiar uh, and I think that that's true of ever so much art 
and uh, in painting, paint development from pop art and various things, these things. It's so true that you that all of a sudden it becomes very familiar. But when it first came out, it, it just shook you up. And I don't, I, I admire architects who can do that and have it later become familiar and loved. OK. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.